Ding, ding, ding. Hey. Hey. That's a good way. We'll, we'll let the uh, senior professor get your attention here. Um, come on in. I, there might be room. There's still seat or two up front here. Yeah, there's still seats up front. There's a couple. Don't be shy. Um, I, uh, for the last, we've been running this, this is the fifth year, fourth year of our speaker series, specifically in the Department of Biology. And um, up until this year, we have started our January lecture focusing on predators. We've had lions, we've had bears, we've had wolves. And this year, um, there's, there's some predators in here. There's some predators in here. <laughs> They're microbes. <but. laughs> we, we're doing something a little Humans. different starting with chemistry. And I have to say, this is the best yet. You can keep with wolves and bears and lions, and we get a better turnout. So I, I'm excited. Um, well, they might leave real quickly, too. <laughs> uh, for those of you guys who don't know, this is Dr. Steve Parker. Um, his research is on Georgetown Lake, which is experiencing changes in lake biochemistry, stemming from its shallow nature and nutrient influx due to development, deforestation, and heavy recreational use. Uh, seasonal anoxic layer near the Lake bottom under ice cover has been identified along with the presence of reduction of chemical species such as methane, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia. I'm going to leave the remainder of the introduction so I don't steal the thunder of the that talk. That was a lot. It was a lot. I, you know, I, didn't, I say these out loud in my office um, in preparation. <laughs> um, but without further ado, Steve has been uh, at Montana Tech uh, for how many years? I didn't see him. 28 now. years. 28 years. Um, and uh, excited to hear Thank okay. you. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't expect anybody was going to be here. Would, would somebody get, maybe get the lights, the front lights anyway? Just make it easier to see the screen. Thanks. Okay. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to come here and uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the work uh, my colleagues and I have been doing up at Georgetown for the past number of years. Uh, a pretty fun and exciting place to work. Uh, you get to see some wildlife and other activities while you're out there. We've been out working in the lake in open water. We've been out sampling through the ice there. Uh, there's my cohort back there, uh, Bob West with me out there lowering some equipment down through the, down through the ice. So uh, this has been pretty interesting and fun place to work. So uh, why should we study freshwater lakes? Um, well, uh, you know, just some, some, some generalizations. They're certainly important components of, of global carbon cycling, and that's, that's a, a critical component of our, our whole uh, ecosystem function. Um, they're, they're very susceptible to human activities, uh, nutrient loading from a variety of sources, uh, uh, other, other activities. Um, there's some estimates out there that put uh, methane emissions to the atmosphere naturally occurring methane emissions, something like 40% of naturally occurring methane emissions coming from freshwater lakes. And kind of the, a bigger, broader question is, is how will climate change affect all these processes, the functioning of, of, uh, of freshwater lakes. So, um, and, and while I go through and, and present some of our results and talk about some of the things, I want you to kind of keep in mind, you know, my, my background is as a chemist, so I have a tendency to approach problems from that perspective, but uh, you know, I'm out here working in a natural system in, 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 you know, in the environment, and so there's all these different interfaces at play coming together. So we've got you know, ecosystems that the chemistry is interacting with, one affecting the other. There's the hydro hydrologic, geologic environment out there interacting with all this. So it's all, uh, all a big mixed up system. All these things are occurring and interacting and influencing each other, so keep that in mind that you know, truly to do environmental work like this, you have to be somewhat of a multidisciplinary person and take that kind of approach. So a uh, couple of acknowledgments up front uh, before I get going too far. Uh, uh, certainly Chris Gammons, my mentor, colleague, uh, collaborator for a long time, has uh, been a big part of this study. Glenn Schaaf from Geological Engineering has done a lot of the hydrogeology up at Georgetown more recently. Uh, our good buddy Simon Paulson um, uh, from Nevada, Reno, has been out on the ice with us, and and uh, he's our uh, stable isotope geochemist down there in Reno. Done a lot of uh, done a lot of work for us. 
been a whole series of graduate students that have cycled through projects at Georgetown. Bill Henney uh, here uh, did a lot of the preliminary work with Chris up there. Tyler Johnston came along. Um, Elizabeth White and Katie Mitchell working with Glenn on hydrogeology. I've got George Williams' name up here, although he didn't, uh, he wasn't involved with Georgetown as a master's project. He was out there on the ice and in the open water with us a number of times and uh, had a big help in ter as a field resource and uh, did a lot of work with us. More recently, Bob West has uh, been a uh, big contributor to uh, our understanding of the functioning of Georgetown, especially under the ice, and a lot of the data I'm going to show you today came out of work that Bob and I did together. Um, John Doerr and Eric Boyd from MSU have been uh, a component of this. Uh, we've had some funding from NSF, more recently from Institute on Ecosystems over out of Missoula, and some of this work is already published in biogeochemistry, and some of it is in a paper that's in review in, in biogeosciences now. Uh, here's, uh, here's Tyler here. I forgot to point him out when I mentioned his name before. So most of you are probably familiar with the location of Georgetown. Uh, here's Georgetown Lake. It's bounded on the, mostly on the south side by the Pintler Range, kind of on the east side by the Flint Creek Range. Here's the Anaconda down here in the valley. You drive up Warm Springs Creek going west out of Anaconda, come past Silver Lake into Georgetown, and if you squint real hard, you can just see the ski slopes at Disco up here uh, in, the, in the picture as well. Kind of a nice setting, uh, interesting place to work. So uh, a little bit of a little bit of background on Georgetown. It, it is a reservoir. Here's the dam. Most of you have probably driven past there. Hard to see in this picture, but there is George Williams down there trying to collect a water sample out of the outflow coming out of the dam. Um, it's a relatively shallow lake. It was a big, grassy, wet, uh, boggy meadow uh, before flooding for, to, make the, uh, to make the reservoir. Um, it gets a lot of recreational use now, um, a lot of fishing pressure, a lot of development up there. You've probably been up there and seen some of the more recent trophy homes surrounding the lake and a lot of older development as well. Um, in, back in the 70s, the EPA classified the lake as uh, eutrophic based on nutrient loading. And over the years, that nutrient loading has decreased uh, to a certain extent. Um, and uh, the, the lake, in terms of nutrient chemistry, is, is tending to be more uh, oligotrophic. But what it still does is develop this uh, significant anoxic zone near the bottom of the lake uh, under ice cover, and I'm going to talk a fair amount about, about that. An open-ended question that I won't really address is, is the sort of the direction of productivity within the lake changing um, as lake function changes. And uh, if you've been up there out in a boat in the summertime, usually visible, especially later in the summer, a large stands, a white stem pondweed, and a cara, uh, a multicellular uh, stem-like algae uh, that grows in the lake. And so there's there's some questions about the direction of the productivity. This is, uh, has anybody been up to see uh, Emily's Spring in the, in the springtime when the rainbows are in there uh, spawning? It's on the east shore of the lake. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a fun, fun site to go see hundreds and hundreds of rainbows just clustered in that little area there. So uh, here's just a kind of a schematic map view of the lake. You come in from Anaconda uh, down here, and if you drive along the east shore, uh, you go up here past the dam and then on down Flint Creek towards Peaberg in that direction. The road goes up to Disco uh, up here. Here's the North Fork of Flint Creek coming in. Here's Emily Spring, Stuart Mill Spring down here. Most of the water that enters Georgetown comes in along this eastern margin of the lake. And from Glenn Shaw's work, there's some evidence that groundwater leaves the lake going west, and certainly water leaves the lake up here by the dam uh, going on down Flint Creek. Oh, wrong. Your, your depth line is there or in meters? Your, your yeah, I'll go back to that. I hit the wrong button. <coughs> You, you. Okay. 
Yeah, the, yeah, the dip lines are meters. So, um, you know, the, the uh, I'll, in fact, I should mention that these are the, there are four sampling sites that Bob and I worked at. Principally, a lot of the data that I show you are from the Badger Bay sampling site over here. And so we're in the ballpark of, of 20 feet deep, give or take, um, depending on the pool level of the lake seasonally. <coughs> So uh, what do we do uh, if, there, if we're going out on top of the ice? It makes a nice platform to work on. So go out and auger a hole through the ice, drop down an a, a instrument to, make, to measure uh, pH and temperature. So we're, we're going down, getting a vertical profile in that water column, taking, uh, stopping at you know, every couple of feet going down, taking a measurement, pH, conductivity, temperature, um, et cetera dissolved oxygen concentration. And then we also have some tubing attached here uh, so we can pump water to the surface and collect our water samples for a variety of other um, uh, measurements, sampling uh, along the way as we go down, getting the <coughs> vertical profile from the surface down to the bottom. We've also collected some shallow sediment cores uh, at the, from the bottom of the lake. You can see a, a chunk of one sediment core here with some freshwater snails uh, that have been captured in the, in the sediments there along the bottom of the lake. Summertime, we went out in a boat. Here's, a, here's Bob piloting his dad's boat. Uh, that was a, a real, his dad was just great, came out with us, spent a lot of time taking us around the lake, and uh, it, was a, it was a real nice asset to have that for summertime work. And if you're fortunate enough to see one of the, the uh, Georgetown Sentinels when you're up there visiting the Great Gray Owl is always a fun, uh, makes your day when you're, when you're up there. So uh, lots of visits out there. Um, here's Tyler and his wife Lydia uh, sampling on the ice in a, during a January time. It's nice to pick a nice sunny day like that so, and, and hope that there's no wind while you're out there. Here he's pumping, he's holding up a jug of kind of purple colored water. And uh, so as, as we go down under this, under this ice cover, we get to a point where the, the uh, lake goes anoxic. And, and I'll show you more, a lot more information on that. But sometimes the bottom two to three meters of the lake will be, uh, it will be, will be no oxygen. And so this is a, uh, uh, a specialized uh, bacteria that's growing down there that gives this pink color to the to the water to our filter here that we filtered the water through um, that's growing right below that chemocline right below that uh, boundary between into the anoxic zone here's Tyler collecting a sample Bob and I getting ready to auger a hole into the ice Here's Chris Gammons all buttoned up collecting a water sample there this is one of the sediment cores shortly after collecting it, uh, getting ready to bag it up and hold on to it for a while. George Williams and Tyler, uh, one time in open water, we went out in a couple of canoes, anchored them, tied them together, and uh, sampled the water column uh, from, from the canoes like that. So uh, let's look at a, a little data then, enough preliminary stuff. I'm going to show you a, a series of these graphs that are vertical profiles. So this is surface of the water up here going down, uh, depth in meters uh, from the surface down to the bottom here. And uh, then uh, so whatever physical or chemical parameter we're looking at uh, has got a horizontal scale uh, for measurement uh, along here. So this is uh, September 2013. What I'm going to do is walk you through one season uh, from open water in late summer and go through the winter and come back to uh, uh, early spring right after the ice came off the lake and kind of look at how the water chemistry changes as we step through those seasons. So uh, open water, end of a nice warm summer. Uh, water is very well mixed. So one of the things in a relatively shallow lake like Georgetown, wave action, wind action, keeps the lake fairly homogeneous. Uh, most of the time. So you see the temperature profile is pretty consistent with depth. Um, dissolved oxygen, DO is dissolved oxygen, lots of dissolved oxygen, pretty consistent with depth, good habitat for the fish in this case. Um, pH is pretty consistent. D 
DIC is dissolved inorganic carbon, and uh, I'll talk in and out about that, but dissolved inorganic carbon is a combination of the CO2 in the water column, the bicarbonate, and the carbonate um, in there. And uh, pretty consistent, increasing near the sediment bed. And I guess uh, one thing that's, that's fairly obvious from this is even though most of the water column is fairly well mixed, there is this influence of that muck at the bottom of the lake on what the, on what the water chemistry right above that right above that sediment water interface is doing. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we, as we get there. EH is the redox condition or the oxidation reduction condition within the lake. Um, again, well oxygenated water, very oxic through the water column. But again, you can see there's an influence of that sediment bed on that redox condition within the lake. So open water, um, and we'll fast forward ahead here to January. So uh, the, there's been ice now. We've got a cap on the lake. We don't get that vertical mixing anymore. So that's one thing with open water. You get wind and wave action that has a tendency in a shallow lake to disturb the, uh, the water column and mix it fairly well, fairly uniformly, top to bottom. As soon as we put that cap on the lake, then we lose that, that mixing ability and the, and the lake becomes more stratified as time goes on. So now, temperature profile kind of goes in the other direction. Very cold right up here under the uh, ice cap. Warmer down near the uh, uh, sediment bed where we have a little bit of a thermal reservoir down there. Dissolved oxygen decreasing with depth. And what's important to notice about the dissolved oxygen now is by the time we get down to the bottom, it's zero. So that, that, that bottom water uh, under, the, under the lake bottom is starting to become anoxic. And if we throw on there a three milligram per liter line, which is the state one day minimum aquatic life standard, what you see is almost that bottom two meters of water now is below that, below that one day uh, aquatic life standard. The seven day average is four milligrams per liter, so that would push that zone up even a little bit further uh, in terms of that. Still plenty of oxygen up here, so uh, you know if you're out there ice fishing, you want to be fishing shallow rather than deep uh, in terms of the lake. Uh, pH dropping uh, near that sediment bed again. Dissolved inorganic carbon increasing dramatically as we get down to the sediment bed. And remember I said that that DIC is a combination of CO2, bicarbonate, and carbonate. Whereas the CO2, a lot of the CO2 is coming from respiration. Uh, all the decomposition, all the microbes down here chewing on the organic material. Uh, dumping out CO2, and so you get this dramatic effect on the inorganic carbon towards the bottom. DOC is dissolved organic carbon. So uh, as the microbes crank away, chewing down the more complex organic molecules, they produce small, more soluble molecules, and that's what this is measuring here. And some of those leak, some of those organics leak, or microbes leak those molecules out, and so we, as a, kind of evidence of that activity, you see this increase in the organic carbon in solution towards the bottom of the lake there. And you know, if, you have, if I'm not explaining something really well, totally mystify you. Let me know as I go along no here. No penguins in Montana. No penguins in Montana? I have that wrong? I sure, I saw some out there. Um, they're right there. Let's, let's fast forward ahead one more time. Uh, so we went from September to January, now we're in May. Uh, we've had ice on the lake for about six months now. And uh, now the temperature profile is fairly consistent with depth, but um, it's still very cold under the ice. Now this is thinning ice here. Um, when we were out there, this, it was, I think it was May 8th of 2014, there was about 18 inches of ice at that time. I'd been out there in the previous March, towards the end of March, same year, and there was almost three feet of ice uh, at that time. So uh, this is dramatically thinning, but colder water right under that ice and then pretty consistent temperature-wise all the way down. But now look at what the dissolved oxygen is doing. Now it hits zero up here just below the four meter depth. So I've drawn a, a dashed line across there representing that chemocline boundary where the oxygen drops to zero. If you put that three milligram line on there, 
then that, that zone that's uninhabitable for fish has even moved up further uh, with time as, as the winters progressed. I've also added, so the dissolved oxygen is dropping to zero. I've added another uh, curve on here for the partial pressure of dissolved CO2 in that uh, system. So CO2, product of respiration. Um, and the, so, you know, if you're consuming the oxygen, producing CO2, then uh, these, pro the, these two curves should be relatively inverse in, in their relationship, which is what you see. pH is going down. And that's largely due to this increase in CO2, which is a weak acid, so uh, kind of related there. Uh, increase in DIC, not surprising with an increase in CO2. And here's our redox condition. Notice that that has a big inflection right at the same point that the dissolved oxygen goes to zero. And actually, our redox condition goes to negative values down here, uh, strongly reducing environment, which uh, that reducing environment then gives us down in this, uh, below this chemocline boundary then, gives us a, a really different environment. Now we can accumulate reduced species like here's ammonia, so a reduced form of nitrogen. Here's methane accumulating in that, in that bottom zone. Remember, we've got an ice cap, so we're not mixing the lake. This, is, this lake is becoming very stratified, and this zone is persisting down here and accumulating some of these species. Uh, such as ammonia, such as methane. Sulfide, when you pump that water from below the chemocline boundary, it stinks. It smells like rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide. And uh, so it's not surprising that that concentration is building up. S sulfide has reduced sulfur. Here's sulfate is oxidized sulfur. So uh, right below that chemocline boundary, they switch roles with the, the reduced sulfur increasing in concentration, the oxidized sulfur decreasing. Uh, that's a very characteristic of bacterial sulfate reduction going on there. And actually, uh, a little bit of chemistry. Uh, sulfate, now we, we don't have any oxygen down here. You know, you and I are using oxygen as an electron acceptor right now. Well, there's no oxygen down there. So these microbes use sulfate oxidized sulfur as their electron acceptor. Still burning organic carbon, so like that granola bar that you ate this morning that you uh, burned up through your respiration while they're still using organic carbon, but now they're producing hydrogen sulfide uh, as a product there, and that's why the water is so stinky down there. Total suspended solids. Um, so we take a piece of filter paper, we weigh it, we, we filter about a kilogram of water through it, dry it, weigh it again, and we get a measure, this time in milligrams of suspended solids per kilogram of water. This is an idea of what's suspended in the water column, at least in terms of mass. Notice there's a big increase below that chemocline boundary, and when we look at the microbial composition, we'll come back to that a little bit. Okay. Um, so I showed you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go backwards here a little bit. I showed you methane um, just a minute ago accumulating in that anoxic zone. This is, st we're still here in May of 2014, um, but I want to just show you some of the evidence that led us to think that methane should be there. So uh, my graduate student Tyler Johnston went out and actually looked for it and measured it. And so uh, here we are with the green again. This is the dissolved inorganic carbon. We al already looked at this. Increases as you get towards that sediment water interface down there. Now I'm going to give you a short primer on carbon-stable isotopes here. So uh, this delta-13 uh, C value is, is a measure of the ratio of the carbon-13 to the carbon-12 in the system. To both stable isotopes of carbon, carbon-13 is about 1% of naturally occurring carbon. Carbon-12 is about not, the other 99%. But they, they ch those ratio, that ratio of, the, of those two changes a little bit depending on what chemical and or physical processes are acting at the time. So the thing to notice here, just kind of in general terms, is as the inorganic carbon concentration increases, the carbon isotope concentration, which is on the scale up here, increases at the same time. So they're both going in the same direction, both increasing simultaneously. Well, a couple common processes that affect carbon isotopes. 
respiration and aerobic respiration in most anaerobic respiration processes. Of course, they're anaerobic, they're not using oxygen, but just the same, they're producing inorganic carbon, aerobic respiration here, producing CO2. So the inorganic carbon concentration is going up, which we do see. But the isotope composition does the opposite. It, go, it gets lower. And these are both going in the same direction. So uh, that doesn't fit in this case. Another common process that affects carbon isotopes is photosynthesis, really just the reverse of the respiration, in simplistic terms anyway. So photosynthesis is fixing CO2 to organic carbon, producing oxygen. So we're consuming the inorganic carbon. Its concentration goes down, which is not what we observe here. And the isotope composition goes up in this case. But again, they're, they're going in opposite directions. We don't see that here. So the logical explanation for what we're seeing in terms of the isotope effect here is methanogenesis. Um, Chris and, and Bill Henney hit on this first. And so the, the, the concept here is that a, here's a small molecule, acetate. And uh, this is uh, an example of what's called a disproportionation reaction where uh, it's the carbon in that simple molecule is both being oxidized and reduced at the same time. And so this specialized group of microbes takes the acetate, converts it to inorganic carbon. Here's bicarbonate as, as inorganic carbon. But it gets predominantly isotopically heavy uh, the inorganic carbon does, and the methane that it's producing ends up isotopically very light. It's lower in isotope composition. So the fact that the inorganic carbon is increasing, you're making inorganic carbon, and it's getting isotopically heavy, agrees with what we see here, which was our evidence for the fact that methane was probably being produced out there in Georgetown. And sure enough, we went out there and looked for it and found it and have measured it over several seasons now. Another interesting isotope factor here is we looked at the dissolved organic carbon increasing, that's the stars there, and at the same time the carbon isotope composition increases. Well, um, it, it's, it's sort of a no-brainer if you want to think about photosynthesis. Remember what photosynthesis is doing is taking inorganic carbon, which we're making over here, and fixing it to organic carbon. Well, we're looking at the organic carbon here, and if we're taking ever all increasing isotopically heavy inorganic carbon, which is what we're seeing, and we're fixing it to organic carbon, then it makes sense that the organic carbon is also getting uh, isotopically heavy at the same time. But we're down here. There's no oxygen down here. So what are we doing with photosynthesis? down there at that point. Well, uh, the explanation is what's called anoxygenic photosynthesis. There are microbes that use the energy from sunlight to fix carbon to organic carbon, but they're not making oxygen. They're doing something else with those electrons. And, um, uh, but they're fixing the isotopically heavy inorganic carbon, so we see the organic carbon get isotopically heavy. And, and sure enough, Eric Boyd, our uh, microbiologist partner from MSU in some of his water column sampling did, a, did identify right below the chemokine boundary uh, microbes that, that do this. So we've got a couple pieces of evidence for that. Okay, so microbes. I just, just said microbes. Let's, let's talk about microbes. Um, I've got to switch dates a little bit because th this is the only microbial analysis we have in the water column. But uh, Eric from MSU did go out with us on the ice, collect water samples. So this is, again, a vertical water column sampling uh, under ice cover. This happens to be uh, an April 2013 sampling adventure. This is the chemokine boundary at the time right here in the, in the dashed line. So, uh, and so what we're plotting is microbial DNA in micrograms of the DNA per liter of water. And we're using that density of DNA as a proxy for microbial biomass in this case. <clears throat> so, you know, pretty consistent uh, through a large portion of the water column until we get down near this chemokine boundary. And then we get a big 
increase in microbial biomass. We drop below that chemokine boundary and you get an even bigger increase. So what it looks like is, you know, the highest density of microbial biomass is actually down in that anoxic zone, uh, making hay on all those uh, highly reduced uh, nutrient species that are being formed down there by a variety of different processes. And so sometimes we call this transition. We have oxygenated water up here, oxidized species. We have reduced conditions down here, uh, reduced species with can act as electron donors. So we call this a disequilibrium. And so we've, we've got niches for microbes that can uh, use that chemical disequilibrium and uh, live on it, uh, derive energy. I mean, that's what they've got to be able to do to survive is, is make energy by transferring electrons from one place to another. So, okay, so the last under the ice <coughs> Uh, adventure we had was May, uh, uh, May 8th of 2014, so now we'll fast forward ahead one more time to June of 2014. Uh, this is about two weeks after the ice came off, uh, completely off the lake, and we sampled at all four of those sampling sites across the lake. Um, it, uh, Bob's dad's boat had a very nice name, it was called Therapy. Uh, <laughs> liked being out there in that boat. Um, anyway, I guess the take home lesson here is that all these parameters at all, all sites across the lake are pretty homogeneous, pretty well mixed top to bottom. Uh, as soon as that ice cover came off the lake, uh, wind wave action and maybe, maybe density um, turnover, uh, that lake has become fairly well mixed top to bottom and, and stays that way most of the summer uh, throughout throughout the, uh, the lake. Okay, where are we at? So uh, methane, let's, let's follow that methane seasonally now. So I showed you one profile, uh, just in, in a vertical water column for methane increasing once we get down into that anoxic zone. Now we're gonna look at methane concentration. We're just gonna measure <coughs> in the bottom water. So these are all samples taken about six inches off the bottom at that Badger Bay GT2 site. So we'll just follow concentration over a couple of seasons here. And the blue dashed lines are just sort of general trends in, in methane concentration in that water near the bottom of the lake. So this is back in, in uh, during, over the winter of 2013. You can see this general increase in methane concentration um, actually, this is the last time we measured. And then uh, we didn't get out that season. We did not get out uh, right after the ice went off the lake when we measured a little later in the summer. Um, the methane concentration was not zero. It was measurable, but it was much lower than it, it gets in the winter. Then the next winter season, um, this, this point is December right after uh, ice, only a few weeks after ice on the lake. So there wasn't much buildup of methane then, but you can see it increased over the course of the winter. And uh, this, was, this sampling was only about two weeks before ice came off the lake. And then we were out there two weeks after ice came off. And all four sites that we sampled at were down to uh, a low but still measurable concentration. So uh, the, the concept is that that sediment bed is still cranking out methane, but now because the water column is mixed, it's, and, uh, it's not building up like it can under that stratified condition that builds up in the, in the winter time. So, uh, I've talked a lot about the water column. I've only intimated a little bit about the sediment bed. Let's let's make a little more integrated approach to, to looking at the whole, whole shooting match here, see what, we, see what we come up with. So the upper part of these graphs is the vertical water column again, so depth in meters below, the, below ice cover now. This is actually uh, March 2015 uh, data here. And um, so vertical water column below the ice, but now I, I've throwing this hatched line in here, which is the sediment water interface. And now we're gonna look down into the sediment bed a little bit. 
And uh, one thing to, to keep in mind is the scale is different. This is a centimeter scale down here. This is a meter scale up here. So they're not, the scales aren't to scale. But what we did, um, this is on its side here, but we used a, a, a fairly simple device that uh, has the affectionate name of Peeper. I'm not sure why it has that name. Um, but it's just a, a clear plastic block that has channels cut into it. And uh, it, we actually insert this thing into the sediment uh, so it would turn it upright and insert it down and, and work this. It's kind of wedge-shaped down here at the, at the bottom so you can work it into the sediment bed. And the channels that are grooved into this plastic block are covered with a, with a nylon membrane, a semi-permeable membrane. So the, the concept is when this thing is inserted down into the sediments, you've got pore water within, this, within the pore spaces in the sediments. So you've got water in there that has dissolved solutes in it. We want to measure those dissolved solutes down in here just like we're measuring them up in the water column. So you leave this for several weeks down stuck in that sediment bed. Those solutes in that sediment matrix water diffuse and uh, equilibrate with the water that you started out with in the, uh, in the channels in here. So if you leave it in long enough and you pull this back out, the idea is that these channels in there have water that's equilibrated with the dissolved solutes in the, uh, um, in the sediment pore water. And you can get a, a window into what that pore water looks like. So that's, that's what we're looking at in these lower panels. And we'll start over here with methane. And I've, I've included a little inset here with dissolved oxygen just to give you the idea that at four meters in depth, that dissolved oxygen concentration goes to zero there. So that's going to be the, our chemocline boundary somewhere around there. <coughs> and notice that the methane concentration starts accumulating once we go to zero dissolved oxygen down there. So here's the, the full profile starting to accumulate methane once we get down below that, uh, that boundary. And now we look down into the pore water in the sediments. Notice that it's almost like it's a continuum. That methane concentration keeps increasing to about the four centimeter depth down into that sediment. So uh, what, that, what that tells us, what that says is that the, the methane generation is occurring down here. The, the main uh, methane generation activities are occurring somewhere at this depth and the methane then is diffusing or bubbling up out of the, uh, out of the sediments and then accumulating in the water column uh, in that static uh, anoxic zone above there. Dissolved organic carbon here, again, increases uh, when we get below that uh, chemocline boundary, keeps increasing to about the four centimeter depth. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, relationship there. Get over to dissolved inorganic carbon. Starts increasing below that chemocline boundary, increases down to about that four centimeter depth. So. Uh, it starts to look like there's, there's you know, a very bioactive zone occurring right about that depth down into that, into that sediment bed. <clears throat> um, if we look at the carbon isotopes of the dissolved organic carbon, you do see that there's a discontinuity there. In the water column, the, is the isotope composition of the organic carbon is what we say isotopically heavier than it is down in that sediment pore water. There's, there's, there's quite a, a separation between those two. This, though, is, is very characteristic of anaerobic environments where methane generation is going on. If you can think back to that equation that I put up here with methane, with methanogenesis, one of the things I said there was that it makes isotopically very light methane. So there's microbes down here that are eating that light methane incorporating that into their own carbon. And so what we see is the organic carbon down here is isotopically lighter in that anaerobic environment where that methane generation is going on. Uh, inorganic carbon isotopes become isotopically heavier. We looked at that earlier. That's characteristic of methane generation and keeps getting heavier as we go down into that sediment bed. 
because of those, that isotopically heavy inorganic carbon that's being formed down there. Um, look at a few other species. This is same kind of graph, water column here, sediment pour water down here. Here's ammonia, reduced nitrogen starting to accumulate in that anoxic zone and reaches a peak somewhere around four or five centimeter depth into that, uh, um, down into that sediment bed. So uh, pretty obvious that the, the, the reduced nitrogen, the bulk of it is being formed down here in these sediments, diffusing, uh, making its way back out of those sediments into the, into the water column. Sulfur tells a little different story. And um, we looked at this kind of a graph like this before where once we get down in that anoxic layer, the reduced sulfur, stinky water can form. The sulfate is getting consumed in bacterial sulfate reduction. There is some sulfide down in the sediment pore water, but it's less than it is here in the water column, which uh, leads us to believe that a large portion of the sulfur is just being recycled within the lake. And we are getting some contributions from here. There's going to be some surface water contributions coming in. But uh, the sulfur, to a large extent, we have isotopic evidence that agrees with that fairly well, that, that sulfur is just recycling within the lake here. Um, increase in manganese and iron, uh, those are both uh, uh, metal species that are known to uh, act as electron acceptors when you get down in those anoxic environments and their concentration increases. So uh, let's talk microbes just a little bit more here. Uh, this is also from this March 2015 sampling. I sent a sediment core over to Eric Boyd in, at MSU, and he did some microbial analysis down in the sediments. So taking chunk by chunk the sediment core and taking it in segments with depth going down, extracting uh, 16S ribosomal RNA from those uh, chunks of sediment. This is characteristic microbial RNA. And so this graphic is just the density of that microbial RNA, again, using the density, in this case, of RNA as a proxy, proxy for microbial biomass. You've got the biggest concentration right up here near the sediment water interface decreases with a spike right at that four centimeter uh, depth down into the sediments. So there apparently uh, is some consistency with the chemical with, between the microbial data and the, the chemistry we were seeing around that four centimeter depth. The, uh, all the RNA was segregated into operational taxonomic units, which are essentially genus level designations. And uh, uh, there's a lot going on in this center graph. Uh, the only one I'll point out is methylocinus here with the red triangles. Um, methylocinus is a known uh, photo or a methanotropic uh, genus, meaning it eats methane. It's, or it's a series of organisms that eat methane. And so we remember back previously the highest methane concentration was at the four centimeter depth. So here's this big spike in a known organism that eats, uh, eats methane at that same depth. So uh, some consistency there. Any microbiologists in the audience know what the inconsistency, inconsistency is with methylocinus? There. Uh, I, I won't, maybe I won't step in doo-doo and, and tell you that. <laughs> I was, I, yeah, it's, Methyl, the, 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 at least in the literature, the known uh, species of methylocinus are obligated aerobes, meaning they need oxygen to, to operate. So uh, while, uh, and, and I know Eric went back and went over his, uh, uh, his taxonomic data um, uh, and was convinced that's what he was seeing, so this may be <coughs> evidence for a variant of methylocinus that hasn't been cataloged before that uses some other electron acceptor other than oxygen. That's our best explanation. Diversity and richness, again, I don't want to step in, in the doo-doo and try and explain that, but um, uh, they roughly measure the, roughly measure the same thing. Uh, diversity of organisms is the greatest up here near the surface of the sediment. 
not surprising. You've got fresh plants dying, fish dying, snails dying, uh, phytoplankton raining down, inorganic particulates raining down. You've got a very heterogeneous, nutrient-rich environment up here, and so you have the greatest diversity of organisms up there chewing on it. Uh, not surprising. That diversity drops off until about the four centimeter depth and then is relatively consistent uh, with depth below that doesn't change a whole lot. There, you know, there's the there's the kind of the four centimeter line, and a lot of things, a lot of things seem to come back to that. So uh, let's just make a picture here, uh, try and wrap it up uh, fairly shortly. So we'll just make this picture in, in, in two two snapshots. Open water here, so no, no cap on the water, vertical mixing of the water column. Uh, we're gonna have good oxygen concentrations throughout the water column, low concentrations of everything else, um, and uh, lots of phytoplankton within the water, so we got uh, very active oxygenic photosynthesis going on. The sediment bed down here is still cranking out, doing its thing, maybe in the summertime when water temperature is warmer. This is even more active, but we don't see the accumulation of uh, all these reduced species down here because of the mixing of the water column. We form ice, we get into the winter situation. Now, we've got this cap on the lake. The lake becomes stratified. We have this chemocline, this boundary between oxygenated water above, uh, anoxic water below, and so we're, 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 we've used up the oxygen and all these other species accumulate in that. We have evidence for anoxygenic photosynthesis occurring down here and the highest microbial density, interestingly, below that chemocline boundary uh, as well. And the sediment bed continues to crank away and, and juice out all these reduced species which now without the mixing of the water column can accumulate down here. So, um, uh, what's going on in terms of the carbon? Well, because uh, I, I mentioned that, that freshwater lakes are part of the, the bigger package of global carbon cycling, so let's just look at what we can say about Georgetown in that concept, context. So here's a sediment core again, so this is depth down into the sediment core, and what I'm measuring now is total carbon in that sediment core in milligrams of carbon per gram of, of sediment material. And these are three different sites uh, near the dam in Stuart Mill Bay and over in Badger Bay here. So you can see there's different concentrations of carbon depending on where you're looking at the sediments in the lake. But one kind of consistent uh, thing about, the, about that sediment profile, about that carbon profile, is it, it, it kind of consistently decreases over time. You, you figure the, the vertical axis is a time scale. This is recently deposited stuff up here on the surface. This is much older material down here. We have a pretty good idea where the, uh, the uh, original pre-flooding, uh, pre-reservoir surface was because we get a, when we look at these sediment cores, all of a sudden we'll get a dramatic change in composition of the, of the material in the sediment core. Um, so we have a pretty good idea where the bottom of the, uh, the actual lake sediment is. We know about how old that is, so we can get, it on, get an idea on the timeline here. We know the dimensions of the sediment core, we know the amount of carbon, so we can come up with a rate of decrease, and if we make some broad stroke calculations, we come out with uh, in the ballpark of 10 to the nine grams of carbon being released from this sediment bed, and this is averaging over all three sites. Obviously, there are different amounts of carbon in the different sites. So averaging over all three sites, we get in the ballpark of 10 to the 9 grams of carbon per year being released from that sediment bed, probably mostly in the form of CO2 and methane, which are a large portion of which are off-gassing. Every spring when that lake turns over, there's going to be a big belch coming out of the water column to the atmosphere. And a lot of that's going to be methane. Um, and important thing to think about methane is as a greenhouse gas, it has about 25 times the radiative forcing capacity of, of CO2. So uh, you can't just think of these lake sediments as a crypt for carbon. 
yeah, you're, you're putting carbon in there, but uh, through processes acting on it, uh, a, a significant portion of that carbon is, is being remobilized and, and, and re, re, uh, goes back to the atmosphere. So uh, what do we know? There's large seasonal fluxes in methane concentration, and I should mention that uh, some researchers in, uh, in Wisconsin measured atmospheric fluxes of methane around two lakes in Wisconsin right after ice off. So it's pretty evident that you get these large releases of methane to the atmosphere when the ice comes off the lake. Um, we have sediment processes driving a lot of the water column chemistry. Uh, we've identified anoxygenic photosynthesis. And we have this big interrelationship where the micro microbiology is driving the water chemistry, vice versa, and, and uh, you, you got to remember to think of it as a, as a big interrelated system. And um, pretty interesting project to work on. And then uh, when, when sampling is done, then here's George Williams out wakeboarding behind, uh, <laughs> behind the boat out there. So. Um, so if you come looking for me, I'm retiring at the end of this semester, so if you come looking for me, uh, you'll probably find me out in my field office somewhere. Um, and uh, uh, not around here so much. Questions, comments, thoughts? I'd love to hear perspectives uh, from anybody. Yeah, Doug. Um, so what about the fourth segment? So you said the fourth segment, that last slide is on the third column. Yeah, we only did three for those sediment cores, yeah. Unfortunately, didn't do the fourth one. I don't know, we were lazy that day, or George wanted to go wakeboarding or something. So, the other thing, it, it seems like, and I think it's going to be a little roughly, it's like something like 10 to the 8 liters of, of say, methane, okay, understand the conditions. Uh, for 10 to the 9 grams? Or? Yeah. Well, you've got to remember that's a mixture of CO2 and methane. You know, methanogenesis, is it 50-50? 10 to the 7th Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of methane. So, you know, there was that one estimate that 40% of naturally, natural methane emissions are coming from, coming from lakes. Yeah, my, my, my 10 to the 9 number is in the, in the ballpark of literature values uh, for, for those kinds of emissions, carbon turnover. There, there, there's, there's definitely a range there, and you know, each lake has is, is got its own identity, its own level. Of, and the productivity, you know, so Georgetown is, <coughs> has this history of being trophic from nutrient additions. That's going to drive a higher level of productivity than maybe a lake that doesn't have that same level of nutrient addition. Yeah, Colleen? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'm just following up on that, the methane, the 40%. Yeah. Globally, 40%. Yeah, and that's naturally occurring. Still, you know, when you look at from industrial commercial processes, the naturally occurring methane emissions are, it's just a, are, are chump change. I have heard so many different uh, sort of definitive statements on what is producing methane. And, and uh, I have heard that it's pea fogs that produce most of the methane. I've heard that it's uh, Thanksgiving dinner that produces <laughs> methane. I've heard that it's cattle yeah. that produce most of the methane. And, and you know, the, the, the thing about the freshwater lakes is that such a tiny area of the Earth's surface compared to what the ocean is. Well, yeah. And you know, and that's that's a certainly a big question. As water temperatures warm, are we going to start melting more of those uh, clathrates and and releasing methane, and we lose the ice cover that? reflects the heat energy off of some of those, those very waters. Probably so. And, and one thing I didn't point out, or didn't mention, if I can find my little device here, um, there's, there's experimental evidence that shows that 
as average temperatures increase, the kinetics of the, process, the methanogenesis processes increase at a faster rate than general respiration processes. So the, the idea being that average temperature increases may increase methane production faster relative to CO2 production in environments like this. Yeah. John. Did you mention that uh, the nutrient load at Georgetown Lake has increased? That's, that's the uh, findings, yeah. Um, oh, I lost his name. What's the guy from UM? Uh, Stafford. Yeah, did a, uh, UM did a, a nice multi-year study. And there's a report out, uh, Department of Justice, I think, for, for that, that documents decreasing nutrient load concentrations. Uh, so his summary was that the lake is tending to become more oligotrophic, less nutrient laden, but this anoxic zone under the lake still develops and looks like it's over time is increasing in depth each, each winter on the average. Yeah. Now there haven't been fish kills in a long time, that, to my knowledge up there. There are historically have been fish kills in Georgetown, but one one uh, piece of literature that talks about that suggests that that's back in the day when Anaconda Company was pumping water for the smelter out of Georgetown. So they were, and they were pumping rel surface water for the most part. So they were lowering the lake level and taking that oxygenated water off the top of the lake. And then there'd be fish kills. And, and even so, if you maintain an acceptable pool level, Draw yeah, there's no irrigation in the, in the winter time, so yeah, yeah. The, the pool level stayed fairly high in the winter. Yeah, but if you start out at, what is it, 6427, this full pool, I think, if you start out at 6421 or something of that nature, you, you decrease the size of the pool enough that there's limited right. uh, oxygenated zones. For right, and, and, and so as it, uh, that's, that's another piece of the puzzle, as that, it, it, you know, historically, uh, especially from Craig's work, it looks like that anoxic zone is increasing with depth on the average. So you're pushing those fish into a smaller and smaller environment. So, and, you know, anytime you concentrate fish, you increase their density, then you run into other problems that can influence their viability, transmission of diseases, and, and, and other, um, other problems. You know, the, the east side of the lake doesn't even have ice cream. What these data is showing is more for the center and less part of the lake. The east part, where Stuart comes from, and obviously all of their states come from. Yeah, that, well, probably more so. And, and you know, there, there is photosynthesis going on, even though, even, the, even if there's three feet of ice on that lake, there's still photosynthesis going on in the water right under that ice. There's phytoplankton that are cranking out oxygen, so, you know, it helps keep that water oxygenated even under the ice cover. Yeah. What did you say the thickness of the sediments was? Uh, Three centimeters? No, it's, it's, it's uh, the cores that we collected were, well, the, the, the cores we collected were 17 to 19 centimeters. Yeah, but that's on the old. And, and, and so, the, so somewhere between 15, depending on the location, somewhere between 15 and 17 centimeters, we changed from that organic rich sediment to a clay layer, which we're assuming is the old pre-lake bed surface. Yeah, I mean, and you look at, if you go up there now and you look at all those plants that grow in there in the summer, those huge stands of white stem pondweed and everything, and a lot of that dies and, and uh, so you, you get a big load of material going to that sediment bed. A lot of it's probably organic. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's very organic rich. Yeah. During the temperature checks where you're doing the depth checks, did you ever reach a thermocline within your six meters, or were you close enough to the sediment bed where it was pretty steady temperature the whole time? 
be being below in that anoxic zone or yeah so like if you were you know if you were to go down about six meters or seven meters if you hit you know a thermal climate because six or seven down. meters is about is about the the bottom it's of where we get to um, uh, let's get a one under the ice here Especially on the open surface, I'm just wondering if there was. Any so here, here's here's after about drops. here's after about six months of ice, and you see the temperature profile is pretty consistent all the way to the bottom. So it's a it's a chemical uh, cline there it is not a thermal cline okay. um, per se. But you know when that ice comes off, you can see where you know the ice the water temperature you know here right below the ice is about one degree so when that ice comes off that water warms up and the highest density is four degrees C so you may get a density turnover at that same time because you're well above four degrees C down here. Other questions? Yeah. This is a more general question but let's say trends continue and ice cover, days of ice cover um, so the, the question was, you know, if, if, if the general trend is, if the period of ice cover is decreasing because uh, you know, average temperature increases uh, climatically, um, well, certainly the, the, the buildup of this anoxic zone is, you're not going to have as long a period for that to accumulate. You're going to have a longer uh, warm water growing season, so you, maybe you're going to add uh, more organic material. You have the possibility of adding more organic material. If you have longer growing season, these stands of pondweed and other, other species, uh, longer season growing phyto, you know, for the active phytoplankton up here, which rains down, adds to the bottom. Uh, so maybe you're accumulating more organic material and uh, so you have to have this bigger, fresher load of material for the microbes to digest down there. Warmer temperatures uh, suggest that the, the uh, decomposition rate is going to be increased at higher temperature. So, you know, maybe, I don't know. I, I, you know, I haven't sat down and done the back of the envelope calculations. It's going to be a different scenario. We don't see in the, you know, in the summertime, you don't see that accumulation of methane, but it's still being generated. And, you know, you, you've, You've probably been to a, a lake and walked around in the uh, lake in, a, in the summertime. You stir up the bottom with your foot and you see bubbles coming out. That happens. You can be out there and you know in the canoe on the lake and all of a sudden you see bubbles coming up. And uh, when the when the there's no ice on there, so part of that's probably methane coming out uh, all the time and CO2. So it doesn't doesn't really stop that scenario. Thanks.